The war had been won by the new model army. The king had been executed. And you had, after seven years of fighting, an army which had grown in political and religious consciousness and which was looking for ways of settling a new republic, a new commonwealth in new terms. Like all historical moments, it's very complex. There are many different uh, cross-currents. There are many grievances about pay and conditions of work amongst these soldiers, conditions of service amongst these soldiers who've been marching and counter-marching for six, seven years, uh, and who then suddenly found they were being sent off once more to put down a rebellion in Ireland. But you also had the mounting pressure of, if you like, direct democracy, delegate democracy in the election of agitators of the people who might be of any rank, privates, corporals, cornets. The demand to control that army through uh, an elected general council the demand for the settlement of the Commonwealth on democratic lines, on a universal manhood suffrage with only servants and persons who had fought in the king's army excluded. I think we want to say this was a valiant army. It was a thinking army. It was very much a thinking army. Uh, tracts, pamphlets, sermons, were circulating continually among the soldiers and increasingly in their camps. So that in a sense, it was a premature uh, uh, workers' educational association or yeoman farmers' association, soldiers' association, citizens' association with around the campfires in the tents at the evenings, discussion groups about, uh, element, uh, uh, pr about the very principles of democracy. I think you also have to say it was a very zealous army. Uh, motivated by a great spiritual zeal, um, a, an intransigent spiritual zeal, which is expressed in this extraordinary marching song of theirs. The Lord begins to honor us. The saints are marching on. The sword is sharp, the arrows swift, to destroy Babylon against the kingdom of the beast we witnesses do rise. This is the time that Gerard Wynne Stanley and Everard start practical digging, where notions of social leveling, of communal life, pressure of millennial beliefs is moving across the country. This is the time when Colonel John Lilburn the great pamphleteer and orator of the Levellers, uh, but who is a London man who commands that tremendous allegiance of the London citizenry and apprentices. He and his closest colleagues are thrown in prison and are awaiting trial on charges of high treason. It is this moment when partly it is often argued, here yeah, I'm not an expert to say, partly in order to get these seditious leveller horse out of the country, they were sent to Ireland. Several regiments of horse moving across towards Ireland uh, mutinied at Salisbury. Uh, their senior officers in the main withdrew from them and those others who didn't want to support them. And with no particular leaders, Cornet Thompson, the brother of Captain Thompson, was, was one of them. They marched up by way of wantage to Abingdon, to Newbridge, finding Newbridge blocked. They were about to force it, but were persuaded by an, a mediator to go north and swim the Thames. And they arrived weary, utterly exhausted, on the 14th of May at Burford, putting their horses out to grass because it was believed that they were not actually in a state of war with Cromwell. The promise had been given as they understood by Cromwell that he would not pursue them, that they would negotiate. Now, this was a very critical moment for Cromwell because they were in fact sending out emissaries to other regiments, 
will level a support. And with a thousand already in arms and risen, they could very rapidly have gained support from other level of regiments and have virtually been in possession of the field. And there's one thing that Cromwell never failed to be in emergency, and that was decisive. And in an extraordinary forced march of nearly 50 miles, he came up behind them, moved swiftly up, and forced his way into Burford while they were still at sleep at midnight, and defeated them with very little struggle. What I see today we are commemorating is two kinds of courage. Moral courage to follow faithfully what you believe to be right, and physical courage which allowed these men to face death unafraid. First then a brief extract from a contemporary account followed by a short passage from St. Matthew's Gospel. First, Cornet Thompson was shot, then Corporal Perkins, accounting it a great mercy that he was to die for this quarrel, and so died gallantly as he had lived, religiously. John Church stretched out his arms and bade the soldiers do their duty, looking them in the face till they gave fire upon him without the least kind of fear or terror. In the words of Jesus recorded in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. Whoever then will acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. It was only a couple of months after Burford, his feeling had risen so high in London, that when Colonel John Lilburn, the great leveller spokesman, came on for trial for high treason, in an extraordinary day of drama, a London jury refused to convict him. And this against all the pressure that Cromwell and the grandees and the judges, very much the judges, could bring upon that jury. London's Guild Hall, the jury returned, having been retired for an hour. Crier, John Lilburn, hold up thy hand. Clark, what say you? Is he guilty of the treasons charged upon him, or any of them, or not guilty? Foreman, not guilty of all of them. Clerk, nor of all the treasons or any of them that are laid to his charge. Foreman, not of all nor of any one of them. Clerk, did he fly for the same? Foreman, no. Which no being pronounced with a loud voice, immediately the whole multitude of people in the hall, for joy of the prisoner's acquittal, gave such a loud and unanimous shout as is believed was never heard in Guildhall, which lasted for about half an hour without intermission, which made the judges for fear turn pale and hang down their heads. But the prisoner stood silent at the bar, rather more sad in his countenance than he was before. And these acclamations continued throughout the streets of London. That night, abundance of bonfires were made all up and down the streets. One of that small but critically important series of political trials in which the jury stood between power, law, judges, and the Englishman's or woman's sense of justice. Can I remember again? I think we should remember, because probably these three had sung this song as they marched. The Lord begins to honor us. The saints are marching on. The sword is sharp, the arrows swift to destroy Babylon. Against the kingdom of the beast, we witnesses do rise. This is very extraordinary, uh, rising up from that old England. You'll notice how that 
imagery carries on. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O oh, clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. Blake comes directly, and I think I can now trace the direct ways from the 17th century antinomian tradition, the little sects in London that led through, and Blake's parents were probably members of them, to uh, uh, the, the William Blake of the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, and when I emphasize this aspect of these levelers, I think I mean two things. They felt they were in a spiritual contest with the beast. And they had an extraordinary sense of um, uh, the autonomy of their own judgment and spiritual faith. That is, each member of this army who was filled with this kind of belief felt that if he came to a conviction of faith on a matter, then he must act as a witness. And without pressing my own views too far, I think the kingdom of the beast is perhaps stronger at the end of the 20th century than it's ever been in the history of the world. It's as strong as the old Roman Empire, but it's more technologically perfect. And the wings of Leviathan, as they would have seen it, the wings of the beast, the wings of Leviathan, of the superpowers with their nuclear arms, crowd the whole skies of the world. And it's that kind of spirit in which the witnesses rise against the beast that I think should be transmitted by the levelers to us. Thank you very much. In 1649, to St. George's Hill, a ragged band they called the diggers came to show the people's will. They defied the landlords, they defied the laws. They were the dispossessed, reclaiming what was theirs. We come in peace, they said, to dig and sow. We come to work the land in common and to make the waste ground grow. This earth divided, we will make whole. So it will be a common treasury for all. The sin of property we do disdain. No man has any right to buy and sell the earth for private gain by theft and murder.